So, um, you're all coming here back to school. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your time at home and everything else is fine. So, this class is going to be development of horticultural crops for our next slot. Um, your lecturer is Dr. Newton. I will be assisting him. There is a TA to this class who has not reported yet. So, as that's when the individual reports, you will be introduced to the teaching assistant. I am a believer in theory. So, um, we we'll start the class today by getting to know a bit about the course, um, what we expected to know at the end of the course. Um, yes. So, development of horticultural uh, crops for exports. So, what we are trying to do is um, there's a category in agriculture, as you have been taught since first year. You were introduced to different aspects. You had the animal science, crop science. Uh, Economics extension. So this is a part of agriculture as a whole that you've been studying so far. So what we are going to do now is that we are looking at horticultural crops for exports. There are certain crops that fall under horticulture, and we are looking at how we can develop these crops for exports. The potential is there. I think Mr. James will take us through some of them. There are a lot of crops that we have here that hasn't been developed yet. I'm sure any of you have seen how they transport plantain and our produce. Do you get it? So this course is going to focus first on the identification of the crops. We'll first have to categorize which crops we classify as of the horticultural crops. After doing that, then we are going to move into the second section, which we'll uh, we do with the identification and the development of that particular crop. From that section onwards, we will move into the export of the crop, which will uh, land us on standardizations. Uh, there are regulations to everything we do. So we have DBLA who regulates the vehicles in Ghana. So there are different bodies. So we will have to pay attention to, um, how do I say, it? standards, which kind of controls how we do things to be able to meet a, a particular market that is when you are exporting these crops after developing them. So that's a bit about the course. We have a course outline. So it starts with um, horticultural crops, the importance of food standards, and then the value chain, as I stated initially. The major standards, organic fairs, okay, fair trade, certification and inspection, what are crop development protocols, identification. Okay, so let me just take it through this. So I think we all know what horticultural crops are. We'll go through it again, food standards. We'll see the importance of food standards. Then we'll see the major food standards that we have. Then the importance of certification and inspection. If you are going to export a crop, you want to be sure that whatever it is that you're exporting is good for human consumption. So there's also a regulatory body for that aspect, which will come around and inspect your farms and make sure that you are producing something that is good. And then the, the consumer is always safe anytime they consume from you. So at that part, we are going to look at the importance of uh, certification and inspection. Then what are the crops development protocols? So the already established protocols that will be needed to be able to develop a crop to meet a particular standard in different countries. So the identification of promising crops. So um, can we all see? some few crops that we deem possible or has the ability to meet the export market. So I'm sure we're all familiar with tiger nuts. Are we all familiar with tiger nuts? Then we have ginger. We know ginger. And turmeric. Who can tell me the difference between turmeric and ginger? Yes. <laughs> Very good. They look the same. 
if you are not Singapore, you think turmeric is ginger. Unless you taste this and you notice there's a bit of a difference between them, but the color is something you have to tell. So once you break through it, you should be able to color your plants and that you know that you have turmeric. We have avocados. We all know how avocados, okay? Alright. Then we have peppers, chilies, cashew nuts, moringa, uh, pineapple, banana, plantain, cassava. So um, these are just a few crops that have been outlisted uh, depending on their demands and what they can do and uh, let's see potential markets out there. So it will be our responsibility or a part of the course to be able to individually or in groups identify crops that we deem uh, or that we deem capable of having export uh, potentials out of these listed ones. So benefits of standards, so what we are going to do is that to be able to understand what standards are, we are going to rely on Moringa standards. So we are going to use the criteria for breeding, it's making sure it's acceptable and then it's good for the international market. So even though we are going to go through Moringa standards for this course, we wouldn't have the time to go through maybe onion standards, um, tiger nut standards and all that. So we are going to use Moringa, as, Moringa standards as the baseline. So you could use that same procedure to be able to tell you that uh, based on these criteria, I can do what, uh, apply part of it or there is also another standard that works for that particular selected form of interest. So we are going to see the benefits of these standards. So after seeing the importance of the standards, we are going to go to good manufacturing practices. So under good manufacturing practices, uh, we are going to produce a particular produce to be given to um, for people to consume. So we are looking at or making sure that everything is on point. Everything is on point to be able to meet a particular demand. So we are not, uh, let's say, as we came in here, there are people going around cleaning the place. So all that is part of the good, uh, let me say, good manufacturing practices of the university. Are we all okay on that? So the university puts cleaners in place to make sure that uh, our venues are on point so that we are able to proceed with uh, garments. Another part of the course that we'll go into will be the application of principles for food safety and management systems. So another thing that is very important is the application of the principles. So we need to put out certain safety uh, parameters around so that we make sure that whatever produce that comes out, uh, I'd like to ask a question, who knows blue skies? So blue skies is like a drink that is produced in India in, in Salon. So they have principles that they outline, they have certain regulations that they go through, they have a, a list of activities that make sure that any food or anything that comes out of the factory is good for the consumer. So they base on these principles of food safety. Maybe cover your hair when you are in the factory, don't keep long fingernails, that's something we'll go into details. So it makes sure that anything, uh, any single produce that comes out of the, uh, the factory is safe for the consumer and there are regulations to see to that. So a bit about this course will be uh, going through how to register your products. In case you're able to develop your product and you want to get it out there, we're going to go through a few registration requirements, uh, FDA, I think you've heard of FDA, uh, approved by the FDA. Yes, yes. So a bit about this course, it won't go much into details, how to get your registration done, uh, how to get your name, where you can find the offices in, uh, so in Ghana, and then yes, a bit about that what you need to know, how to get your certificates, certain parameters that you can test out for to make sure that your product is good. So this is a typical one that we have here. Okay, so this is uh, Moringa leaf. So you would need a label, you would need a unique name for your product, you would need a dosage. So there are just a few things that you have to highlight on your label to make sure that if someone purchases your product, or merely your sticker goes on it or is branded by you, we are sure that we have this quality coming from this particular company. We can't have anyone having anything. So your name has to be registered with the FDA after approval where you can go into distribution of your products. Alright, so um, that will be the first part of this particular course. There is also another part that goes into um, just this
So the second portion of this course will be a contract farming. So I'm going to use one example and then uh, we'll end it here. Mr. James will take from uh, will take up from. I'm just going to do a little introduction on this and then we'll take it up. So for contract farming, which will be maybe the last thing that we do, as the name suggests, there are different types of farming that is being done. Contract farming is a bit not too complicated. So we are going to take a company like Blue Skies. So Blue Skies is a typical company that deals in fruits and vegetables. They do blends, they do fresh tax fruits. I don't we all know what fresh tax fruits are. Yes. So with these two things that they do, the volume they need to be able to meet their market is so high. So they can't go into the production of uh, these fruits and vegetables. So what they do is they contract a farmer. Do we get it? So um, Blue Skies manager will come to you and be like, I want maybe 200 or 2,000 pieces of mango every Monday. Are we okay? So then you sit down and then you write a contract and then you mobilize a place. They will send inspectors over, check your farm and make sure you are producing to their standards. Then they have a truck that comes all the way to your farm and picks the produce. So all you have to do as a farmer is to be able to follow good practices, make sure your, your fruits are on point, harvest them, and then put it in the truck, and you are done with your work. So there are different types, so that's just a scenario, or that's just a little or a bit about uh, contract farming, that's just one type of it. There are different types of it that goes into um, how the contract is stated. So with this kind of farm, the one I just explained, where it talks about blue skies, Sometimes you may be lucky that they may give you the capital to start and do everything. That is acquiring your seedlings, maintaining the plants. You get it. So depending on the kind or the nature of the contracts, you may be pre-financed to produce something. Or you may finance it by yourself after the transaction is done and then you'll be given your money, your money. Anyway, so that's a bit about contract farming. We'll go into the theory and then how it's being done and the different aspects of it. Alright, so that's a bit about introduction for development of horticultural crops for exports. So we'll be taking the course to the next uh, phase. This is the first time this is happening in this course. So, lucky for all of us, we have Mr. James Brady around. Uh, yes. So what we are going to do is that he is more into it, urban food security, growing soilless. I hope we know you can grow plants without soil. How many of us are aware of that? That's a fair amount, yes. So, he doesn't just do growing plants out of the soil, he specializes in also aquaponics. That is, he, find, you know, he, find, he has this nice way of doing plants, at the same time growing some fish in an urban setting. So, in your house, you can have um, some lettuce growing and then at the same time have some uh, fishes around. So I wouldn't take much of his time. You're going to clap for Mr. James as he takes the podium. In the southern part of the U.S. in Alabama, uh, my grandfather had uh, 100 acres old-fashioned farming. I hate it. <laughs> so I am more of a 21st century farmer. And the 21st century... Uh, farming is like magical, right? So, the one thing I did as a child, you know, 13, 14 coming up, is getting up at 5.30 in the morning. We had cattle, we had chickens, we had uh, some mules, uh, hit the, you know, plow the mule. I'm like, you know, as a youngster, I didn't like that at all. I'm also a veteran, and um, I actually I got away from agriculture for 20 some years, right? So it was back in probably about 2015, I decided to come back into agriculture. So I trained in hydroponics. And of course, when you get into hydroponics, that's basically just providing nutrients to the roots of the plants, and they uptake all the beneficial bacteria whereby you could produce a crop like every 15 to 20 days, 30 days. Um, so the thing about uh, growing aquaculturally, um, you guys are in a whole new era of agriculture. It's, it's not the same anymore. 
So we're more in the 21st century farming now, right? Which means that if this young man uh, decides he wants to start a farm, build him a greenhouse, um, he can make 200,000 a year. But you need to have an app that connects growers with buyers, right? In the communities, therefore you don't have to be worried about your food that you produce in spoiling. So, um, yeah, that one is good. So yeah, you don't have to worry about your food spoiling. You, you got customers immediately. Social media is like the best thing that could ever happen to this generation. So I want you guys to uh, <clears throat> really be encouraged by this class, Dr. Newton, his leadership, um, and how innovative this could be for you moving forward. Um, so as a result of that, <clears throat> one of the key things that you could uh, focus on is urban ag. Um, whether it's, uh, I just love Moringa myself. Um, it's the new superfood in the U.S. Uh, around the world, especially since COVID. It, it's an immune booster. It's a superfood. You can pretty much put it in anything. Um, I have a regiment myself. I eat two seeds every morning. And typically, I would have a smoothie. I would put it in uh, uh, <clears throat> cereal. Throughout the day, I'll sprinkle some on a salad. Um, but anyway, I want to introduce you to ag tech. Agri tech is the new way, outside of you growing food, you can also be a consultant. <laughs> you don't have to be farming. I mean, you could have your greenhouse, right? You could also be a consultant for other farmers and help them. And this is where the app comes in. So you connect it with everyone, right? Around uh, the continent. Um, so that you don't feel like you're alone while you are taking on this new journey. Um, could I get the next slide? <clears throat> so here we are, 21st century, right? To throw the field away. Yes. These ones can help you go forward and backward on okay. the slide. Tops, okay. uh, vertical farming, edible walls, edible landscape, backyard gardens, community gardens, urban farms, and of course here you have your peri-urban. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not against soil farming the old traditional way. But everybody is moving into the city, right? The urban population is swelling. Therefore, you got to eat to live, right? So what you want to do is uh, <clears throat> learn hydroponics, aquaponics, aquaculture, vermaponics. I'm going to throw some terms out that you may not be familiar with, but I'm going to show you later. Bioponics. Um, so there's different methods of growing nutritious organic food without having the soil. Um, so let's, let's take uh, composting. You can compost all of this uh, non-acidic waste and turn that into compost to grow more food with, right? Using red worms. Now the, the red worms specific purpose is to keep the soil aerated but they also poop when they poop in the soil you have a drip system in your garden and all of that waste gets recirculated and I'll show you where that happens at right but this is where you guys are right now uh, in the 21st century in terms of urban farming like I said if you live in a you may have um, live inside the city where you may have a 20-story building. You can actually grow vertically on every floor, right? That's your new farm. Uh, you could take advantage of the growth space, have three greenhouses on the rooftops. 
down on the bottom here, you may have 10 restaurants from the farm to the table, right? You don't have to worry about a carbon footprint, transportation costs, all of that stuff gone, right? More profit. Yes, sir. None. No, no impact. No, no impact. And the fact that during the rainy season, you could capture the rainwater to water your crops, right? So you are totally sustainable. Now we're going to throw in solar. You got a solar farm, so your operation cost is really minimal, right? And <clears throat> that's the thing that. So we'll throw in solar gardens in here, right? Because solar farming is also like a really key advancement, say, in the last 10 years, um, which makes your farming ability more profitable. Like I said, you can make easily two, 300,000 a year, depends on, now if you got three greenhouses up here, or you're gonna be the king, <laughs> okay? You'll be the king. Um, and you don't have to, like I said, you can hire people, uh, pay them good wages, uh, you'll be totally sustainable, and uh, you don't necessarily have to worry about transport, unless you're shipping stuff across the country, across the world. Um, and the other beautiful thing about 21st century farming is the sustainability. And the fact that if you're a 21st century farmer, now urban agriculture also comes with some challenges because in most cities, you need to have an urban ag ordinance in place that allows you to grow food for profit and to distribute to your neighbors or say if you want to have a juice bar, you want to have a farmer's market, you could do all of that in a shipping container, just sit up on the corner, make tons of money, right? So, uh, and you throw solar in, that means your operation cost is way, way down. Um, and that's the beauty of it. Now we get out here, we're talking, you, you got cattle. I don't deal with that livestock, but uh, we have found a way uh, how to decrease your food costs, I mean your production costs, and your feed bill to cattle and goats by feeding them Moringa, right? Reduce your feed bill by 50%, but you have to pelletize it and add some other <clears throat> nutritious uh, ingredients like duckweed, snake grass, right? Um, the edible landscape part of this is, like let's say you had a park here. In the US we got parks all over the place. Well, what we have not done yet is to have an edible landscape. So you go to a park, you should be able to go pick some fruit off the tree to eat while you're just canvas in the place and having a good time, right? <clears throat> there should be a community garden whereby you can go and pick something yourself, right? Now in a city like uh, some cities in California, you can actually do that like in Sacramento. They have a park where it sits on about an acre and they plant all types of crops. So you can go in there, harvest what you want, take it home, right? It's a limited amount, but at the same time. Over here on the urban farm, you have your uh, hoop house, you may have a greenhouse, you may have aquaponics, and you may have a storage facility back here, processing all of the things that you're growing. Um, so it makes it a lot easier to farm in the 21st century inside the city opposed to down here where you got transportation costs. Now you could still have solar here, but you got to get your food to the market, right? But here, oftentimes the market is already there because there's so many people in the city, right? And you got to eat. Now, if you're living in an apartment building, 
condominium, uh, in a house, you should grow some food in your backyard, grow food on your patio, um, on a deck, any, any open space. So part of your next meal should come from less than 10 feet from your kitchen table. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's real simple. So if you're, you guys are young and you gotta figure out a way to cut your, your living costs down and one way to do that is to grow food for yourself and your families, right? So there's three new phases of 21st century farming, right? Um, cellular. Now this is really, I want you to hone in on this, the cellular side of agriculture. These are new products that you're going to create, bring to the market, right? Uh, whether it's uh, using Moringa as a fodder, pet food, uh, toothpaste, hair products, cosmetics, that's Moringa, right? So <clears throat> you're in an area where now you go to the grocery store, you got pork without the pig, chickens without the eggs, uh, Wine without the grape. Um, so in those cases where you have that ability to create new superfoods, uh, of course, you know, one of the things that Dr. Newton is gonna go through to, to this class, as I'm learning, is that uh, food safety, uh, calibrating your, the quantity and the quality of your food, so that you don't have to deal with uh, health department issues or people getting sick, uh, E. coli, things of that nature, right? Um, so as you go along through your class this year, think about the innovation part of what you're gonna do with your farms. If you're gonna grow indoors or outdoors. And by the way, I'm gonna throw, because it's such a worldwide uh, it has worldwide use nowadays. You throw cannabis in here for medical, okay? Not for psychoactivity and none of that. Just for medical, people that have inflammation, you know, that's where you get into your turmerics and moringa and things of that nature. But don't be afraid to look at combining those because your market is vast. Uh, there are a lot of people around the world that are hunger and suffering from hunger. Now, so we come down here, this is CEA, Control Environmental Growing, right? We're talking about greenhouse, where you control the temperature, you control controlling the water usage, you're controlling uh, photosynthesis, you're controlling the entire environment that you're growing in, opposed to in the field, where you have no control, you wait on Mother Nature, because Mother Nature says, plant by March, harvest it by September. I'm telling you now, you plant in a controlled environment, you harvest every 30 to 45 days. So you, get, you got revenue coming in year round opposed to once a year, right? So that, that's, to me, that's what makes it really attractive. Now the cost for a, to build a controlled environment environmental farm, the cost, upfront cost is there, but you're gonna make that back in a matter of two months if you got your market set, right? And remember what I said earlier, your market can be controlled right there on the, on the palm of your hand uh, through the app. It also can, you can grow and operate your farm off of your iPhone, right? So how easy can it get? <laughs> you could walk in with a suit every day with a tuxedo on, just dapping around and next thing you know, you don't, you're, you're not even getting dirty because everything is automated, right? So you guys are smart, you're the future leaders. So just think of things that way opposed to, oh, I got to go put my overalls on and some boots cause I'm gonna get dirty. No, you're not gonna get dirty here in this controlled environment. Now, mind you, 
I'm not, I, I'm just kidding about the tuxedo, but I could do that, right? I really could do that uh, in a controlled environment because you really don't, you're not dealing with soil, you're not dealing with dirt. You're dealing with um, uh, new age technology. And here in Africa, where you have an abundance of bamboo, perfect for hydroponics. Perfect, right? So you take your, um, and you could do it in a controlled environment, in a hoop house or a greenhouse. All you have to do is take the bamboo, hollow it out, make sure there's no, you could see all the way through, and then you cut a hole about this big every six inches. And then you put your plants in there, right? Coconut core or uh, some type of media have your seed in there, and you pump your water through the bamboo. Simple, right? So your, your plants are gonna uptake all of that beneficial bacteria. As a result of that, you're gonna be able to grow some very nutritious foods for yourself, your family, the community, and you're gonna be rewarded for it. Um, so here, so there's three phases of this. Cellular, CEA, and down here is what we call accelerator. I have a farm, my farm is right here. It's, it was listed in New Zealand, uh, in the Netherlands as a accelerator. It's called Continue to Farm. I spell it a little bit different. C-O-N, one, zero, two, number two, farm, dot com. It's an L3C, which means that it's a social enterprise. I didn't set it up that way to make a lot of money, but to create impact. So as you think about your business, you don't have to incorporate. You can become a social enterprise. You can attract capital because you're basically feeding the world, you're feeding your community, and you're creating the impact. You're hiring people out of the community, you're teaching the next generation, and you're growing nutritious foods, right? So, this slide here is like, this is the bomb right here. For the 21st century farmers, those are the three areas that, you, just let that sink in. Cellular, controlled environmental farming, and then down here at Accelerator. Because once you get into the accelerator market, that's where you start to attract all of the big corporations to invest in your company. They will be buying the food from you, right? These are the people down here that are innovators like yourself. So <clears throat> if you're thinking about you want to be a 21st century farmer, just know that the pathway has been cleared and it's much easier than when I grew up on the farm, where I had to get up at 5.30 in the morning, feed the chicken, uh, feed the cattle, feed the hogs, uh, catch the school bus, come back home. That's if I caught the bus, I might have to work all day. Um, but you don't have to worry about that no more. Here, you go into your greenhouse, it'll probably take you about, let's just say you had 10,000 square feet. A building as big as this one. Um, it may take you maybe an hour and a half to go through. You're done for the day, unless you're harvesting. Now you're going to employ people to harvest, right? So they're going to come in and harvest and package everything, practice your food standards, and they'll be gone, say, at two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, <clears throat> But you as the, the owner of the farm, two hour minimum, daily. Seven days a week, but hey, it doesn't matter. Like I said, you get up and go to church, you go check on your farm before you go to church. And after that, <clears throat> you're on about your day. Um, no worries, uh, because everything's on your phone. You control your nutrients. <laughs> You can control your water in, you control the, the temperature inside of it, your greenhouse. So 
There's no excuse for you to fail because you got it, everything right there, right? And you could be in, uh, let's just say you wanted to take a trip over to uh, Malawi, Kenya. Your farm is here. Well, you can still operate it off of your iPhone, right? No problem. You got workers back there, so if anything need to be tinkered with, you can do that, right? Okay, so let's see. You had a question? Go ahead. Um, is it mention of um, using bamboo as a media to grow mm -hmm. When you're talking, share something like, like you have to create a goal right, so that you can look to, to the end. Mm -hmm. and I, my question is, uh, when you create the hope, and like, and we are able to look to, like you said, uh, you, you you supply it with water. Yes. Then when you, when you put the water in, the water will drain away. Yes. Like when you look at that, so um, the question I'm asking, like, uh, what, like you, you have to, I mean, uh, cover the end of the so that when you when you fill it with the water, the water will not drain away. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So. In uh, using bamboo, his question was around, you know, uh, recirculating the water. So what you do is uh, you have a little uh, a drain because uh, you're going to create a drip system that continuously waters your plant. So water will flow through the bamboo throughout the day. At the end, all of that water goes into a reservoir, right? And then we're going to recirculate it over and over and over again, all day long, all night. Uh, that's the, the magic to it. So you could use uh, bamboo or you could use, um, let's see, you see the rain gutters on the homes where the, you know, the rain comes on the roof and it drains off on the side? Well, you could use those same gutters uh, just like bamboo, same thing right uh, so you don't have to worry about that it's 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 all control uh here's something I'm, this is brand new it's it has not been proven but we only did it for 60 days so this is moringa it's it's all this is all pvc pipe real cheap right it's all buried in the ground on gravel. Now look at that. This is a, it's a nursery. So this is a way to grow Moringa really fast, 15, 45 days, start a nursery business, right? 15, 45 days. These trees right now could be sold for $20 a piece. <laughs> Multiply that times 5,000. Look at all that revenue you're making every month, right? It's like crazy. So the idea here is, what you don't see in this picture is, um, okay, so this is uh, 40 days from seed, right? Now, over here, you can't see this, but there's two fish ponds there. This is out on a fish farm as a project that we did. So what we did is we, we drained the water from the fish pond back out over here. We cleaned it up and then we pumped it into these what we call bowel columns. And each one of the bowel columns has a long sock. It's like a sock you have on. That's where we put the media in, just a bunch of gravel with a seed and we pumped the water up, we missed it. Psst, just spray the roots of the plants because the Moringa has a tap root, which is, gets really long, right? And all you have to do is provide the, the uh, nutrients to the plants and this is how you get that, that growth. So this tree right here, 35, 40 bucks at 40 days, right? Now the other thing is, this is probably where your Moringa has a higher protein quality. So if you're just gonna grow it for, for at this height, you got a, a choice. You could either harvest it, the fresh leaves, or 
you could have a nursery business. So it's fifteen days to forty days. <laughs> you got money coming in. The farmer old time, old fashioned farming, twenty twentieth century? No. This is all about revenue generation, right? You have fat pockets. You, you, you don't have to worry about all that overhead expenses uh, like, uh, say, my grandfather did. Now you can get paid just on a month-to-month -month basis or every two weeks. And the one thing I will say is um, you want to be able to set yourself up in a way where <clears throat> You got constant revenue flowing just like the water inside of your greenhouse, right? Yeah, well, with this type of work, all the time, like, uh, what's the starting of the donation period from the time you put the seed in the, in the media? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, for how long will this start or the start the media? How long will the media last? Yeah. Or, well, Mm -hmm. When you use that one to grow the plant, like, what would be the germination period or the sprouting period from the time you put the seed? Oh, about three days. Three days? Yeah. And, so you, and you start harvesting it for uh, maybe for 40 days. Or 40, 40 days. So, right. uh -huh. so uh, <clears throat> yeah, his question was around germination and harvesting after you plant your seed. So you're not using soil, you're using like coconut core, uh, lava rock, or stuff like that, right? And <clears throat> it, it's not that expensive. So once you, you have it in, in uh, your media inside of your gutter or your bamboo, um, you just pull it out, uh, harvest it, and then you clean it out. You'd have to swab you're after because there's a lot of roots you don't want to clog your system up right so you just swab it out and there's a way that you can have your bamboo set up where it's really uh, coarse inside there's no uh, material that's loose that uh, help clog up your system and you're ready to grow so this one is called the backyard bioponics okay now here is, this is a typical fish tank, but we don't have any fish in here. We're using fish waste. So here is the system whereby, uh, this is all new innovation, right? But we got uh, peppers, we got tomatoes growing here. And it's cheap PVC piping, right? Innovation. Now, if you wanted to take this out, so we got, let's see, two, four, six, eight, ten. If you want to make 50 over here, you just add it on and take it as far as you want, right? Now, see right here? That's a 100-watt solar panel. You're not using any. You're off-grid. <laughs> so where's your cost at? Just your own labor. That's it, right? So, yeah, this is called bioponics, and this is in a home in Los Angeles in the backyard. So, growing tomatoes, peppers. I mean, uh, you don't necessarily want to use viney crops, um, but right here, see the red? That's where your media just hangs down in there suspended, right? Your seeds. And same thing as I shared with you earlier, we got a pump and a timer here. You got your pump, you got your timer. So every 45 minutes. So this one is called a backyard bioponics, okay? Now here is, this is a typical fish tank, but we don't have any fish in here. We're using fish waste. So here is the system whereby, uh, this is all new innovation, right? But we got uh, peppers, we got tomatoes growing here. And it's cheap PVC piping, right? Innovation. Now, if you wanted to take this out, so we got, let's see, two, four, six, eight, ten. If you want to make 50 
over here you just add it on and take it as far as you want right now see right here that's a hundred watt solar panel you're not using any you're off grid <laughs> so where's your cost at just your own labor that's it right so yeah this is called bioponics and this is in a home in los angeles in the backyard so growing tomatoes peppers i mean uh you don't necessarily want to use viney crops um but right here see the red that's where your media just hangs down in there suspended right your seeds and same thing as i shared with you earlier we got a pump and a timer here you got your pump you got your timer so every 45 minutes you got out of your grow bed and sell it as a liquid fertilizer okay so you you i'm just talking to you about revenue generation opposed to uh just growing the food up top this is aquaponics in Hawaii and anybody familiar with Hawaii way out in the middle of the ocean right these are floating rafts and they have uh, Mozambique tilapia growing and saltwater asparagus okay this is out in the middle of the ocean on the island so the way they harvest it is they put on a bodysuit, they walk through the water, they take all of the rafts and they push them into a, an area where they harvest all of that saltwater asparagus. Now the fish, they could herd the fish in and harvest the fish anytime. They also grow, um, um, I, I can't think of the name of this other product that they create but as you can see so there's two three different methods we, we've shown you thus far right and the idea is that farming is much much more simpler than it used to be so you don't have to worry about the things that I just said earlier about your harvest your overhead which is really critical so you should be able to have a nice balance sheet at the end of a harvest where your profits are way up here opposed to down here or you fell or mother nature came through with a wild storm and just wiped everything out well if you're growing indoors you're in control right so you should be able to replicate that on a monthly basis weekly basis to a point where you are in control of your farm now these are just here that I've things that I've noticed here in Africa you, you got so many different things that you could put soil in to grow so don't be afraid to try something simple like this just a little box right that someone throwing away you take that and you're growing food and you sell in the back and it's cheap it's a cost effective way for you to go into business without having to do or endure a lot of overhead um, <clears throat> If you're going to grow tomatoes or viney crops, always put it on the wall. You don't want it in the middle of your farm because it takes up too much room, right? Always put them on a toward of a wall and then you can trellis like tomatoes, melons, things of that nature. You could just trellis in it and uh, have the support necessary. But so this is over in Hawaii. I was there some years ago at the university and I was shown this and I thought it was very interesting. Now the guy right here, he was from Saudi Arabia, way over in Hawaii. Now he has his own farm. Um, but here, Louisiana, hydroponics. Remember I said earlier about gutters, rain gutters? That's all this is, rain gutters. They're growing lettuce, right? Every two weeks they harvest. All by the palm of the hand on the iPhone, right? This was after a major hurricane. 
Now, the thing about in a controlled environment, you do need a good photosynthesis. So you here, we got lights, right? You got a good lighting system here, but the material, as you could see, this is mostly all PVC. This is not steel, right? It's cheap structure. And if they wanted to, they could actually be growing food on these rails. So you could take advantage of all of that open space up in there and have other crops growing. They just hang them in a basket, right? <laughs> so down here is where all of your, your media is, your, your, I'm sorry, your nutrients and everything. This is a drip right here. That's a drip. So the water just recirculates throughout that entire system. And these guys, uh, they're making a lot of money. Here, this is like an edible garden, outdoors, you know, growing herbs and spices, the old traditional way. That's still fine if you want to do that. Um, but I wanted to give you a little bit more, open your mind up uh, to diversify your growing operation so that the type of revenue that you want to generate will always be there for you. Um, this is growing cannabis under grow lights. Now growing cannabis is a little bit more uh, cost intense, you know, cause you, unless your farm is powered by solar, then you negate all of that. Don't worry about it. Uh, but here we're using uh, lava rock. Lava rock will retain the nutrients that allows this plant to just grow vigorously and uh, again, really fast, uh, you may be able to harvest every three months, depending on what, what strand that you're growing. But every three months, you can look at harvesting and then cult harvesting uh, out of using a lava rock. So that's, uh, I've talked to you about three different media to use, right? Coconut core, lava rock, and vermiculture, right? A vermi post. Uh, this one is a garden that I put in the schools. And these are all uh, vermi posts here with the worms in the bins. And I have six bins here that goes all the way around, right? And on the bottom back here is a reservoir, a 30 gallon reservoir, where all of the nutrients are stored. So we basically pump it out through the drip system, and then we drain it all back to this reservoir where we recirculate it again. Real easy. Um, same thing. Like I said, you got all of this material here. Say you got a 50 gallon barrel. You know what I mean? You got a 50 gallon barrel, split it in half, now you got grow bed. Put your plants in there. Doesn't cost you a lot of money. It's, it's really inexpensive. Um, so this is what I call vermaponics. Uh, it's just like aquaponics or hydroponics, except for you're using the red worms instead of the fish waste, right? Uh, this is another garden I have in a school just similar to the one that I just shared with you. Um, so these are the students uh, planting their, their first crop. And this is inside of a greenhouse. Uh, let's just say you want to start a nursery. It doesn't have to be all about food. You could grow perennial plants. Um, like I said, you can have a nursery business. It doesn't have to be about farming and food all the time. It could just, you can sell plants to other people uh, so they can grow at home. This one is uh, hydroponics. And right here we have uh, plastic lining. And underneath here is a floating raft, which is about this thick. And just like I was telling you about the bamboo, um, there's a little hole like every six inches apart where we put the media in. And the plants just sit right on top of the water. And they, 
uptake all of the beneficial bacteria as a result of that you got exponential growth occurring inside a controlled environment so this is like lettuce so you go in your greenhouse in the morning you say let us pray <laughs> uh, again barrels that are thrown away we're taking them now we're growing food in it uh, cost effective uh, a different variety of greens, collard greens, uh, African American eat a lot of collard greens, turnip greens, kale. So you can say kale, yeah. All right. <laughs> well, here's another one inside of a nursery. But this is all aquaponics here. For me, I, I wouldn't necessarily grow this way because you can grow aquaponically, but what happens here? When it's time to harvest, you have to basically take this whole raft off and it may weigh 15 pounds. Let's just say you got a little back pain. That's, that's not good, right? You got to bend down, oh, uh -uh. So what you do is you raise this up to about the waist high. So you just stand in there and then you can trans transfer it to, put it on a, a, a conveyor or whatever and you don't have to worry about, you know, back injury and tomatoes, binding crops, all over here. Uh, different lettuce, different types of lettuce. And you can do, let's see, three, six, nine, about 20 different plants on each raft, right? Now imagine you was harvesting and your place was this big and you had to harvest every two weeks. Or you could stage it where you could actually do this on a weekly basis. I said it would grow every two weeks, but if you harvest this week and you replant, you're going to get a cycle going where you actually have food available for sale on a weekly basis. Now that's a big, big um, change from back in the day when my grandfather was growing food. So 21st century farming is is it. We just have to think about it, uh, look at the revenue generation, how many employees you need, but you can keep your expenses down and your overhead down. And <clears throat> way back here is where we have the fish tank and we're basically just pumping water into all of these grow beds, right? So there's no fish under here. All of the fish is way back here, right? in a big fish tank. I see a lot of tanks around here. There you go, you got a lot of material that you could use. Don't be afraid to raise your, uh, your grow beds up so that you don't have to be bending down all the time, right? Easy on you. Um, this is a floating raft in a different, a bigger tub, right? But this is all lettuce. So you see over here, uh, let's see. Yeah, back here, this might be ready next week. This one will be ready the week after, and so on and so on, two weeks later. So you got it in rotation. You got a constant source of revenue coming in. Um, same thing, all your viney crops out over here, right? And here you got your lettuce, your kale, your mustard greens, and things of that nature. Really simple. Um, the one thing about indoors is you do need good photosynthesis, so direct sunlight is really paramount to your success when you're growing this way, right? So <clears throat> just be mindful of that and choose the right material. Um, this one, Hydroponics. As you can see, there's like one hole there, there's a hole there, a hole there, a hole there. So you may have 40 plants, 200 plants growing right here. Okay? That's all hydroponics. And you basically recirculating that water. Over here, you got your pump and your timer. And right here, the water comes in, it flows down, back over here. Real simple. 
This one here I had uh, set up at the state fair um, in California. And I have a lot of stuff going on here, but this is 100 plants and 15 square feet of space. You know, something like this. 100 plants, right? So down here is my fish tank, right? And I got a pump and a timer. So we pump the water up, gravity flows down. Now I could take it a step further, put a solar panel on it, now I don't have any utility costs, right? So when you think about your farms, think about using solar because that's your key to long-term profitability where you're going to be making a lot of money. Um, but this one has a floating raft here and then I have gutters hanging down, suspended. And in here I have what we call a wire mesh. That's where my media is. And every time that the water flows down through, it up, all of that beneficial bacteria is uptaken by the roots of the plants. Uh, it's an, another way to grow inexpensively. This is, like I said, it's 15 square feet of space. So you don't really have to be concerned about room when <laughs> um, you can actually take this same system and put it on a trailer and go all over the city demonstrating how to grow uh, hydroponically, aquaponically on a flatbed truck, right? This is, now when you're growing, um, when you're growing aquaponically, it's very important that the fish be able to breathe. So this is called an oxygenator. It just keeps the bubbles in the water. You know, the water's... At the same time, you have to filter the fish waste because a high concentration of ammonia, the nitrates and the nitrites, will kill both plants. So your job is to make sure you got good oxygenation and that you're filtering all of the solids out of your tank, right? And there's a process by which you could do that. Uh, it's not that difficult to learn. Uh, once you get it down, don't be afraid to kill a thousand fish, right? <laughs> Before you become successful at it. You can say, oh, all my fish are dead. Oh, no big deal. Go get you some goldfish, start off, because they're cheap. Or any other fish that's germane to the country. And, and use that. Um, not that difficult. Now this one, um, I, this slide here, I made it just for you guys to understand. This is using vermipost. Oh, I'm sorry. You had a question? Uh huh. Everything I grow is what? Yes. It's everything you see here is organic. We don't use no pesticides, no herbicides. And if I did, I would use organic pesticides. Yeah. So speak a little louder. How do you use hydroponic in still water? In still water? Without? Okay, my question is, can you practice hydroponic system in a still water okay. without a floating system or an oxygen storage? Well, so on a hydroponic system, you have to have um, the right nutrients, right? And a recirculating system. And the media could be a combination of media. Lava rock, could be uh, uh, coconut fiber. Uh, you're using media that's really easy to maintain and is cost effective. Um, still water, you do need to add nutrients to your water, right? If you don't have good nutrient delivery in your water, then your food won't grow. Kinda? <laughs> 
I mean that see, there's no oxygen in the water. No. It's still water. Still and water. The, and the plants still grow. When the nutrients are still available. Can the plant still grow? Yes. 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 So this one here is um, this is my system that we designed and this is where we have the school gardens. So right here in the bottom of the bin, and these bins should be food grade bins, okay? Um, which means that they'll last you at least four or five years. Right here is I have a, uh, some real thin cloth that allows the water to go through, right? But before I do that, I put gravel in the bottom, right? So you got gravel and then you got this little thin cloth here and then from there I put the compost in so that everything will flow down and through the system and then go back into the reservoir where we pump the water back again over and over and over, right? So you see here we're putting the compost in, right? And in this case this is premium organic compost we're using. Um, kind of gets to your question. Uh, it's really key to this because you want to keep your cost down as a farmer. Um, this is another a little greenhouse that I designed for school, right? So we use what we call Solaplex material, this really light diffuser, right? And I have my, my garden right here with the drip system. Uh, right here I got 40 gallon reservoir. Now they're on both sides, over here and over here. 100 watt solar panel, right? And over here, I got a 300 gallon tote tank where I capture all of the rainwater coming off the roof and boom. There's enough water in this tote tank to water this garden for 78 days out of the year. Just in case if you need, you know, you got a power outage or if it doesn't rain or whatever, you always got a, a good storage of water there. Um, this is Tower Garden. Now a lot of you got, you're probably like, oh wow, this is fantastic. Yeah, this, this is another bomb kind of way to grow, right, in the 21st century. Um, all of your nutrients is down here in the base of this tub, right? And what you're going to do, pump it up, spray the, the roots of the plants consistently. And then you're going to come in every morning and you're going to say, let us pray. <laughs> so this is a cost effective, uh, it's easy. Yes, I'm sorry. with the nutrients in the system? So what you do is you would, as you check your system every day, you make sure you check the pH in the water, make sure it's 6.57, right? And then from there, um, you add more nutrients. So there's never a deficiency of nutrients here that allows you to grow as many plants as you want, right? So you can have, in this system right here, like a hundred plants, right? And this is inside of a greenhouse, so you see what I mean? No soil, just uh, a bunch of PVC pipes, the tubs with your nutrient delivery system, now on top of your, your greenhouse here you should have your solar panel, right? Now you got solar farm that I shared with you earlier with my system. I, I built this one for a boys and girls club in, in uh, Sacramento, California. And this is like uh, 25 days after we put the garden in. As you can see, the plants are growing, right? All organic. I want to stress that everything is organic. Um, these are some of the, you know, 40 days out, what, what some of the greens look like. Uh, it, this place is so clean, you know, I put AstroTurf down on the floor. So if you want to go in and take a nap, no problem. You put your little pillow and 
just sitting there and the environment is really, really nice um, as you grow. So in terms of shortening your food chain, as I said earlier, you know, you grow it in the garden. You got local farms. This, uh, the CSA is basically community supported agriculture, right? And then you got the farm, then you got transport, you take it to the market, to the plate, right? Like I said earlier, um, if you're growing here and there's a restaurant nearby, maybe next door, or if you're growing on the rooftop, your transport cost is eliminated, right? You don't have to worry about paying the middleman now. Um, so you got the farm, the transport, packaging, distribution, uh, storage, and then finally to the consumer, uh, on and on and on. So home garden, local farms, farmer's market, the supermarket, food delivery services. These are all jobs that you're going to be impacting. And some of them you don't need anymore. But as you expand your operation, you may need to have this. If you're growing, the one thing I'll say is if you decide to farm for a living, concentrate on specialty crops, ethnic specialty crops that carry a higher profit margin. You know, you're, if you're Asian, uh, bok choy. If you're Indian, the curry. African American or African. You can grow kale, you grow your carrots, you can grow all of these different types of veggies that carry a higher profit margin. And that's how you become successful. Um, Here, got Moringa cannabis. As I said earlier, you guys are in the 21st century. It may not be legal today, but it will be in the future. So prepare yourself to extract the compounds from both plants. Create your own new food. Cellular, right? CBD, Moringa, for inflammation, for pain, uh, toothpaste, hair products, cosmetics, unlimited. Um, So it takes the community to raise a farm, right? There's my website, there's my contact, and just to give you a little bit of flavor in terms of how all of this stuff works. Any questions? No, I'm, I'm kind of retired now. <laughs> but I still farm, yeah, yeah. I want to know what inspired you to do it. Uh, my grandfather uh, inspired me to farm, but I didn't really like the old way of farming until hydroponics, and aquaponics, and vermaponics, all of those things came into to surface. Then I got interested again. But I got away from it for like 25 years, right? And so nowadays, I farm when I want to, um, it, it's not an occupation. I, I do more teaching, uh, putting gardens in, I call them learning labs for the, the next generation to learn how to grow for profit and for consumption. Um, it's just, it's really, really easy to do. So <clears throat> I would encourage you guys to um, seriously look at 21st century farm in opposed to the old traditional way because there's a big big world out there and you got to eat to live so grow for what you know <laughs> uh, so let me step into moringa a little bit a part of my journey over here is dr newton and i we met on zoom four years ago we were the only two people that looked like me and you <laughs> out of the whole country of India. And there were 400 people on the Zoom call three days straight. And I still don't know how they found me. Way over in America, but they found me somehow 
asked me to do a presentation. I did. And about three months later, they came back and did Right? So <clears throat> all I'm saying is that, you know, Dr. Newton and I became really good friends after that because three days after the conference was over, there were some other people online and I got a call and said, can you do the presentation again? And I said, sure. I didn't know Dr. Newton was going to be on there, but he was. So the universe just connected us together. And as a result of that, we've been good friends ever since. So now here it is four years later, I'm here before you. I never imagined, never. It, it, it just couldn't happen that way, but I, I want you to use that as inspiration for whatever you do in your life in terms of farming and say, you know, Dad, I want to be a farmer. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're not a geneticist. It doesn't mean that you're not a horticulturalist. It, it means that you've gravitated and you're moving into the new world. Now you're an ag tech consultant. So all of this stuff that I share with you today, uh, <clears throat> six months from now, you can be consulting on your own. It's just a matter of learning hydroponics, learning aquaponics or aquaculture, uh, vermiculture, permaculture. There's all of these different cultures, right? But ag tech, concentrate on the technical part of this because we got agri-food, we also have agri-therapy. Now, in some situations, my nephew, when he comes up to talk, <clears throat> He may connect you to agrotherapy. So one of the things that you could do, say if there's a senior citizen home where you have 200 senior citizens in a care facility, and one way that you're able to um, keep them calm is you have, you build this big wide fish tank and you got the water just flowing, you got a pump and the water's just flowing down and you hear the noise all day long. So they're just sitting there so relaxed and, you know, the meds may be kicking in or whatever. But uh, it's a, it's, I call it agrotherapy, right? So think about the seniors. Also, here's another one. Now we're getting really innovative. All your hospitals all over Africa, they should have a greenhouse. It should be growing. When you get discharged from the hospital, send the patient home with two bags of fresh produce, organically grown right on site, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, this is like, this is where we are, right? Um, so just imagine you, you got a social enterprise like me and you say, well, you know, I want to do something for the community. Well, go to the hospital and tell the hospital, look, I want to put my farm right here, right? Not only are they going to use it to feed the patients every day, like I said, when they go home, they got two bags of groceries, not a sack of pills, okay? Because <laughs> we, we got to get off of this medication. It's, it's killing us too fast because pharmaceutical companies, this is what they want. They want you on the pill, shorten your lifespan. You live to be 50. I'm 70. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm 70. So just think about it in terms of economics. Economic viability. So I'm going to still take you away for a few minutes to get your measurements and mm -hmm. then from there we'll come back. So I'm going to do a little question section at this point. Mm -hmm. Well, as you step out, so you step out with me now. Okay. I'll take your pointer. That's good. Uh, please, <laughs> Um, what I was telling you about aquaponic uh, design. So you see the fish are at the bottom. You got your, uh, your fish waste here, right? Uh, water, after you, it goes through the system, the water is returned with the ammonia re removed. As I was saying earlier, your nitrates and your nitrites is really critical right here that you 
keep a balanced system, therefore your plants will uptake all of these nutrients, right? The nitro back to nitro five, uh, sephira and, and the nitrates. So this is what your grow bed looks like. And there's a good reference on the bottom there of aquaponics and the earth. So you could go back and take a look at, but I wanted you to get a good picture of how this system works, because if you decide to go into it, you need to know what you're dealing with. Um, this is a small scale aquaponic uh, greenhouse using a float system. As I was saying earlier, uh, your float system, uh, let's see. Yeah, you're down below is your floating rafts here. Your fish tanks back here and all of your, your what we call a clarifier, uh, removing the solids from the system. And this is all your grow bed right here, right? So this is an indoor, not so much control environment, but indoor, right? Because it's, a, it's really an open space. Um, here is a fish tank. Now, if I take you back, we're talking about the solids in the fish tank. So we have to have our system uh, where it cleans up the solid waste, removes the solids, so you got a balanced ecosystem here, right? The fish are happy, plants are happy. But you could either, now I could put floating raft on top of here and have this system growing the veggies on top. But in this case, we're just growing fish. Let's just say you want to grow shrimp. You want to grow lobster. You could grow them in a tank without using the fish waste to grow food with, right? So there's a different way to look at it. It depends on what it is you want to specialize in. Growing shrimp, growing lobster, growing tilapia. Um, it's, it's really uh, comes down to that. You having the fish tanks. And you got a lot of uh, I should say I, I've seen a lot of big storage tanks here, right? All you have to do is cut them in half, put your fish on the bottom, and take the other half, turn it over, and put your media in there. You got an aquaponic system right in your backyard, right? Uh, this one I showed you already. Um, this is a combination aquaponics again. Um, using the same methodology, the floating rafts. But this is, a, as you can see, a live ecosystem here, right? You got plants growing, you got good photosynthesis coming in. However, none of these I've showed you other than the ones that I use is powered by solar. So we want to think about bring solar into your farm because it cuts your utility costs down and that means you're making a lot more profit, okay? Floating rafts, uh, I showed you this one earlier. Uh, just build your, your uh, grow beds up so that you're not getting back pain. Uh, these are the tower gardens. Uh, hydroponics again, uh, the school garden. Yeah, these are the, some of the same ones that I showed you earlier. But anyway, thank you all very much. Do you have any questions? I'm looking at the next generation of farmers coming out of Kamasi, the scientists, the innovators, the accelerators, controlled environmental growing and cellular growing, which means that you're going to be creating your own food products, not what's out on the market, the new stuff that keeps you vertical. So you can be old man like me. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure we cannot thank you now just for this precious information. Um, <laughs> and uh, James, we are really very happy and grateful to you for spending your precious time to be with us in Ghana and just be our lecturer. I'm going to be here. I can't sleep anymore after this. <laughs> All yeah. these beautiful faces. Wow, come on. I don't know what I want to say. So the so lady will give my vote of time, but here we are. <laughs> We don't want any little voice here. <laughs> we want to see, yes, you can make yourself comfortable there. I, there's a, a lot we are doing. 
there's a lot happening in the, in the sphere of culture globally. A lot of innovations, and new things are really, really catching on. So for instance, I just wanted you to have a feel of them. What he is in Ghana to do is the fact that we are striking a partnership and most of the food items that we have that you may not probably see that there's such a potential in it. He has his website and he has a fleet of stores that we can produce and then they'll be receiving the, in the marketing. The beauty of it is that we are all blacks. If you are working with the whites, you will know whether they tell the truth or not. <laughs> and uh, to be honest with you, it's time for us as black people look within and learn to appreciate each other and learn to work together as a team much, much better than we have ever worked with the whites. You are much younger, you do not know what has gone on, but if you happen to be a few blacks in an international platform presenting, then you see how people look down upon your color. I mean, your color means, no matter the intelligence you are displaying, you look at your color, am I right? Yeah. 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 All right, but the, the point is that I want people like you to start getting to know what is happening on the ground. And the beauty of it, the, one of the best thing I can say that, as a Ghanaian, anywhere you stand in the world, as a black, you are really constant. That's the video. Am I right again? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So please feel I mean, be confident about yourself and the industry is ready for people like you to come in and do a lot more than you can ever really imagine. So he has, he has had his own branded t-shirts. Wow. He's, he brought them and uh, these are different brands of his t-shirts because it's a market branding of his product right in the US. And we in the here in the diaspora, we're going to be producing and then we will be selling over there. So you look at the dynamics of how we develop the value chain. And uh, all these things that he has shared with you, if you look at how we can even develop it in Ghana, at your back, you go home and you are able to do a small aquaponic and grow some small lettuce and all these things. What do you see you as a special? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so. We want to still make it a little bit lively. I have two drinks here. You're going to have to struggle to make a choice. Whether you like to taste tiger nut drink or carrot drink. I have a grant and I'm researching on this tiger nut drink, an European Union grant, this year. So those of you who want to be part of this, you might want to convert tiger nut milk to tiger nut yogurt. It's sort of the research we are working on. But have a taste of it. In fact, if the European Union, Spanish European Union is able to give us a grant to research on this, you can imagine that they respect this. But I don't know how many of you would choose this drink above Coca-Cola or Fanta. <laughs> I just want you to have a, a, a taste of it. So today, one of the decisions you are going to make is that when you have an MCQ, is that an MCQ or B? <laughs> <laughs> this one or this one? I don't know which one is the correct answer, <laughs> but you will be the one to decide. And I have meat pie for literally everybody, so at least the uh, man will help us. Everybody can have the meat pie. But when it comes to the drink, you must look at any decision. <laughs> and then uh, you can as well have a taste of the meat pie. And let's see. I don't know whether you've been selling Marika meat pie over there. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Thank you. Put the red drink. I got my orange drink. The carrot. The carrot. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> So make a business out of this. So you're cutting two costs. You'll be your own boss or your own entrepreneur having your own company, but as well, you're getting income, but as well getting vitality out of the ground. So you wanna look at the dual sides of it. Does that make sense? So always when you are doing this class with you know, Dr. Newton, keep that in mind. Um, while I'm getting this knowledge, how can I apply this knowledge? 
not even for yourself, your parents, but it's also your community members. Um, so what you're learning today, what you got from my uncle with urban farming, as you was asking the questions, the hydroponics and the hydroponics, do take that with you and utilize that to see how can I benefit all as well as myself. Okay, like two minutes. Um, health benefits, as we said, eating to live. As we know, growing organics out of the ground, um, as I learned from with the doctor these past few days, the benefits of health, vitality, living a long life. You know, as we all want to do, we want to grow old, have some kids, watch the world move how it does. Um, so with that, whoa, kind of loud. Uh, so with that, you can instill that knowledge in other people and help them, you know, build on that knowledge. In America, we're dealing with a lot of cancer, as you may have heard, heart disease, from eating the wrong foods or going to grocery stores and getting processed foods. So with the knowledge that you're getting here and instilling that back in the community, you can help other community members to live longer and let them know, well, you may not want to eat this, you may want to try this, as the doctor showcased with the tiger nut and the carrot juice. Um, those are health benefits to keep our body clean, keep our body um, secure of any mucus, uh, diseases, or any other things that may come that may shut us down or keep, lead us to an early death. So the social benefits, again, is cooperative economics. So as you all know, it's about 30 people in here. Some of you may know each other, some of you may not. Um, you can always partner up with somebody, um, as well as like the community benefits. Um, two is better than one, right? So always keep that in mind. It's not an individual battle. Um, as the doctor said, we're here representing for Africa, uh, myself as an African-American. Um, as, my, as my uncle and the doctor are doing, are coming together. Um, so they see the benefit as working together across the Atlantic. Um, while the doctor was doing his work here, my uncle was doing his work in America. And as well, we all benefit from that. But as well as you taking the class, you benefit from the knowledge of the doctor. And once you leave out this door, you can take that out to somebody else. Whether it be for your own personal gain or just to help somebody else, whether it be uh, getting their health together or just transitioning to a better sustainable lifestyle. Um, whether it be from disease, obesity, or just wanting to do better in that aspect. Economics. As the doctor showcase, um, for me, I deal with community and culture, so those are actually my products right here, um, Dr. Doctor Showcase. Um, so as well, it is all about teamwork and working together. This is called a power crown. As you see, there's many black hands, as we see many black hands in here. Um, but with the sustainability, as I'm saying with the business model, you can all come together even in this class and build something here. Whether in, are you all staying in dorms? On here on campus? Okay, so even with that, you can go out to your dorms or the campus, whoever you're with today, and ask, yo, is there any place we can grow something? Um, is there any open spaces within these fields in nature that we can start a community garden? And even with that, that can help for building friendship and building community amongst yourself or against your program, but as well, help with your tuition. You may be able to go out in the market and sell some of the things that you do grow. So look at those things like that, as in, I sell these, and I sell these as well. But as you see, they're all community-based. Um, as the doctor said, we're representing for Africa, even though that we may not be physically in Africa, walking, we are Africa. So always keep that in mind. Um, when building your business model, you want to make sure that you have everything intact, and you know what you are presenting. As in what the doctor has said, labels. You want to make sure, if you choose to, to make sure that your label represents you and what you are looking to gain within your product. Does that make sense? So as in for me, I'm, with my products, um, I'm promoting African inclusion, African liberation. Um, so that's why a lot of my things are based within, you know, Africa, and whether here on the continent, um, separate countries, as you know, or within a diaspora where we are at, whether in the Caribbean or the USA. Um, so with your products, you want to use visual intelligence. 
As in, you may see that and may identify with that in some aspect. So either when creating your business model, you wanna make sure that the clientele that you are looking for can relate to what you are giving. Um, as in, for myself, those symbols promote conversation. So as long as you can have the conversation, you can build that bridge. And that will help you lead to community. Self-sustaining and cutting food costs. As, we, as I said before, the more that you grow, the more you do not have to depend on somebody else. Um, I know here, growing food and eating to live is a big aspect of the society. Um, but as we want to remind you all, you do not have to wait to go to the market to get what you need. Nature is all around us, which is one thing I like about this campus. You can step right outside and start composting or growing anything you would like and see how that benefit, will, whatever benefit you would like to gain, you can use that economic sustainability to push forward in whatever you like to do. Um, so like I said, I don't want to take much of your time. Um, like I said, I study social work and I look at the social benefits of food security. Um, whether as like in California, do it, does anybody know what a food desert is? A food desert. Yes. Okay, so a food desert is, we are surrounded by supermarkets. A lot of the food that we get, as my uncle showcased, it, um, it may come from a farm, but it may not be distribution, it may be altered. So as in what we got today from the doctor, even just in that drink, the other stuff we're getting in the supermarket is very low. Um, so I want you to use this example of what the doctor has presented, which he bottled, which our brother has made with the pies today. We want to bring that all together. Um, so let me ask a question. How was the food? Tasty. Tasty? And that was made by? Right here. So you have somebody right here who just showcased you what Dr. Nude is going to be teaching you this whole semester, or my uncle was broke down for you. So I just wanted to put that in your brain that it is not gigantic. You don't need a million people. You don't need Europeans or outside of Africa to get what you need. Everything you have is right here on the land, and if you don't have it, you can grow it. And if you don't know how to grow it, ask this man. <laughs> Definitely um, ask Ebenezer, very intelligent man. Ask this brother right here. So I just want you to show, I just want you to know that you have resources all around you. Don't be shy to connect with your community members. Don't be shy to connect with your classmates. Um, Y'all are here studying the same thing. So look out how, how we can do more together instead of doing things separate. Because as Dr. said, as now we are building bridges, y'all are building bridges here as classmates. We're building bridges here as Africans, continental and a diaspora. So definitely use that model. And um, I'm gonna end with simple as this, sir. Just like that. Right. Just like that. Just like that. <laughs> And it's, it's a communication, you all right? Yes. Yes. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, lastly, uh, like I said, I do, I do video production and I also do clothing, Afri indigenous African inspired clothing. So I use symbols as I have here to promote conversation and connection amongst our people globally. Um, so I have some shirts. I didn't bring much. I didn't even know I was going to be speaking. Um, I will get with the doctor to get your sizes if you would like a shirt, and I will send you one. So feel free to just ask, free of charge, no problem. Um, so lastly, like I want to say, this is my, one of my main shirts that we sell. I call this the Print of Africa. Uh, it's red, black, and green. Red for the blood, green for the soil, black for the skin. Um, yes, yes, yes. And... I'll take one out to show you. So as you see, this is a thumbprint. Yeah. So as you know, wherever we go, um, while you're still here, but when you venture out, whether you get your degree, your master's, and want to take your talents elsewhere, um, as us in the States, Africa is in our DNA at the end of the day. So always keep that in mind. Um, and we're just here to build the bridge and live this out. So in closing, like I said, do not be afraid to work with your community members, work with your people around the globe. 
Um, as we're showcasing all, we are healed to build with one another and elevate. Simple as that. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. So he spoke about social, but for the past three decades, when I was a student like you, I started this. For the past three decades, I have never been in need of pastor. I have never bought pastor and I have never needed because of the horticulture I stay. If you go to bed, there's a professor there, Professor Ernestina. She had had diabetes for 26 years. And I sat down with the professor, professor, give me the time. Give me six months and I will repair this condition for you. They told you it is irreversible, but give me six months and I will reverse it for you. Using food. Within two months, she called me to her office and said, my doctor says everything is now normal. So the, the, the social aspect of food, the nutritional, the health, if you are not sick, isn't it better than being sick and you are calling for this and calling for that? Those are the things that are talking about. And uh, the beauty of it is that, like I told you, I started when I was a student. I was thinking about the healing foods and all that, and I noticed that there were all cultural products. And when I started doing my masters, and the more I'm learning, I'm, I'm just realizing that and I envy you to grow with us. When I was a student like you, the world has not been alive. The books we were, read, we were reading to get one book was difficult. Right. Now you can download all kinds of books on the, uh, your phone. Stop Today, I don't have time like 